Is your fab running? Well, you better go catch it. Get it? I did this whole video just to make this joke. Anyway, semiconductor manufacturing is the most complicated process known to humanity that has ever been successfully performed at scale. But what does that actually mean? What is humanity doing inside those massive fabs? You curious? So am I. So let's get nuts. For today's video, we're going to talk about wafer fabrication and the processes going on inside a wafer fab. But first, I want to invite you to a special event coming up in just a few weeks in September. I've done a few in-person events this year in both Japan and Taipei. They've been really fun and I really like having the chance to meet and interact with you guys in person. For this one, we're going to do something a little different, an AI and semiconductor symposium here in Taipei. Dylan Patel from Semi-Analysis and Doug O'Laughlin of Fabricated Knowledge are in town for Semicon 2023. To me, they are unquestionably the top two semiconductor analysts on the internet right now. I am excited to be able to sit next to them. We're going to have a series of presentations and speeches. Some of the topics include AI servers going forward, plus outlooks on the China analog and power electronics industries, and we will also have a few secret guests too. September 3rd, 2023. Tickets are free and the Eventbrite link is below in the pinned comment. We booked a big room and I hope to do a video recapping the event a bit later. Please come. I would really like to come see you in person and shake your hand. All right, on with the show. We should begin with some basics. An integrated circuit, or IC, is a collection of devices. Some of these devices can be active, the most familiar of which is the transistor, which can control the flows of electrons from a source to a drain using a gate and a voltage. A transistor is like a water fountain. Water goes from its source to its drain, and that flow is controlled by a gate. You can actively open or shut that gate using some energy, same as with a transistor. In addition to active devices, there are also passive ones, like resistors and capacitors. As the name implies, they cannot actively control or amplify a signal, but they can change it as it passes through them. This collection of active and passive devices, numbering in the billions, is connected together by a pattern of fine metal wires. If you look at a cross-section of a semiconductor under a microscope, you see lots and lots of layers of different materials, like a cake or something. How do we build this? First, we add a very thin layer of material. There are many ways to do this, and we will discuss some of them. After that, we use lithography to transfer a pattern from a mask onto that layer. Once that is done and over with, we do etching to permanently engrave that lithographied, is that a word? Pattern into the layer. There are many ways to do this, and we will discuss some of them. After that, we might modify the layer's electrical properties by doping it with impurities. Depending on the process and the specific recipe, we might perform this impurity doping step at other points in time too. There are many ways to do this, and we will discuss some of them. After which, we go add another thin film layer so that the whole cycle can happen all over again. For instance, metal thin films for our interconnects. Our chip is made this way. A cycle executed dozens or even hundreds of times over many weeks with excruciating precision. Each step is either adding, modifying, heating, or subtracting those layers on the wafer. Or, or cleaning. 30% of the steps in semiconductor processes are cleaning steps. Many different material layers go into a semiconductor. Those layers can be made from either an oxide, polysilicon, a dielectric insulator, or a metal conductor. The fundamental challenge is how to vaporize the substance atoms, transport them to the substrate, and then evenly condense them onto the surface. The industry uses four methods to create a thin layer. Thermal oxidation, epitaxy, physical vapor deposition, and chemical vapor deposition. Let us start with thermal oxidation. One of the main reasons why we use silicon so much is silicon dioxide. Silicon dioxide is a stable electrical insulator that we can easily form on top of the silicon surface like a tablecloth, protecting it from chemical impurities and other random pollutants generated by other processes. It can also serve as an insulating buffer to prevent one transistor from electrically interfering with its neighbor's business. Silicon dioxide naturally grows in thin layers about 10 to 20 atoms thick when oxygen comes into contact with bare silicon but we can produce thicker layers when necessary using what is called thermal oxidation. 
This means heating up a silicon wafer to about 700 to 1200 degrees Celsius in the presence of oxygen. This causes the oxygen atoms to get much more excited, and so they diffuse deeper into the silicon. Other than the silicon dioxide, everything else above the surface of the wafer is deposited rather than grown. Ergo the phrase, deposition. Because each of these thin films have their own specific requirements for deposition, this industry is very diverse. The three major deposition markets are epitaxy, physical vapor deposition, and chemical vapor deposition. I mentioned them earlier, but I am repeating them for you now. The first is epitaxy. The primary use case for this is for laying down an epitaxial layer of silicon on top of the silicon wafer. Why do we need this? This epitaxial layer is generally free of oxygen and carbon. Despite all we do to make the silicon in the silicon wafers as pure as possible, the Tokrowski method still leaves behind oxygen and carbon impurities from the graphite liners and quartz crucible, which impede performance. The epitaxial layer is usually applied by a wafer manufacturer like Global Wafers, but sometimes the IC manufacturer does it too. Second is physical vapor deposition or PVD. We use this to lay down films of metal. Early on in the semiconductor industry, we use the form of this called evaporation. We put the wafers into a vacuum chamber with the metal we want to target. Then we heat the metal in a crucible to its evaporation point. The metal vaporizes and travels over to the wafers where it accumulates on them as a film. Nice. However, as transistors got smaller, the industry found it harder to reliably lay down consistent metal films over specific features like steps. Steps meaning like the walls and corners of trenches in the semiconductor's structure. In response, the industry introduced sputtering, a PVD technique first discovered in 1925 by the Nobel Prize winning chemist Irving Langmuir. Here's a setup for an absolutely hilarious joke. A wafer, a metal material, and some argon plasma are introduced into a vacuum chamber. What happens next? Well, the energized argon ions are accelerated into the metal material, obviously. The impact of those ions physically smashing into the metal causes metal atoms and molecules to fly off into the vacuum. They then cross the 10 centimeters or so of vacuum space towards the wafer, where they accumulate on it as our desired metal thin film. Yes, this is what happens. I am not joking. The third and most significant deposition method is chemical vapor deposition, or CVD. The technology has applications beyond the semiconductor industry. For instance, we use it to make nearly perfect synthetic diamonds. CVD first entered the market in the 1950s as a way to deposit epitaxial silicon layers, but has expanded to cover a wide variety of substances. In CVD, we take two or more gaseous reactants, our precursors, and have them react with each other. The result then forms on top of the wafer. It relies on chemical reactions to do its work which differentiates it from PVD. That is your basic overview, but there are so many subvariants. For instance, plasma enhanced CVD and the latest, hottest thing, atomic layer deposition, or ALD. ALD, sometimes also called atomic layer epitaxy, is crazy. You lay down the thin film literally, atom by atom. It first entered the market in the late 1980s to help fill trench structures. First discovered in the Soviet Union and Finland, ALD has a fascinating history. I promise to do a video about it someday. Anyway, Applied Materials is probably the dominant company in deposition, with strong positions in both physical vapor and chemical vapor deposition. But Tokyo Electron and KLA also have positions in the space too. Now that we have created our thin films, it is time to transfer the IC design onto those films. Lithography is the core process to achieve this goal. It is a process with three big steps, with many intermediary steps which I won't mention here. First, we turn the design or part of the design into what is called a photo mask. In the case of most industry standard optical lithographies, this photo mask is made from blanks of either quartz or lime soda glass. We transfer the design onto the mask blank using individual electron beams. If a traditional lithography machine is like a printer rapidly stamping a design many times over on a wafer, then the electron beam is like handwriting with a pencil. As a result, this direct writing method can be quite slow, which substantially adds to the cost of mask production. 
This is why it is not often used for producing end-user products. In order to make sure that the wafer can receive that pattern, we apply a photosensitive chemical called a resist on top of it. The resist is kind of like film. It gets exposed to light and chemically reacts to that light, leaving behind an imprint of a chip pattern. To apply the photoresist to the wafer, you first spin the wafer at about 3,000 revolutions per minute, like as if it were the world's most expensive pizza dough. Then we pour the tomato sauce, sorry, I mean the photoresist, on top of it at its center. The resist will then evenly spread out over the whole wafer. We then soft bake the coated wafer at about 90 to 120 degrees to remove water and harden the resist. Engineers have to think about everything. Modern semiconductor fabs build suck back features onto the resist dispenser nozzle because if they don't, then you get resist droplets that might fall onto wafers and cause defects. The leader in these photoresist coating machines is Tokyo Electron with about 90% market share. The resist is absolutely one of the most important parts of the whole system. Don't underestimate it. There is no point in having an expensive EUV system printing at 20 nanometers or whatever if the resist cannot resolve the image. These are often extremely complicated conglomerate chemicals with multiple components. They have to be sufficiently responsive to these high-powered photons, resolve the image, and retain that image through all the subsequent process steps. In the second big step, we use a photolithography exposure tool to first properly align the wafer and then flash it with high-powered light through the mask and optical reduction lens. Lithography is the most expensive part of semiconductor manufacturing. It regularly takes up 30% of the total process financial budget and half of the processing time. ASML in the Netherlands is the market leader in lithography exposure tools. I've done a lot of videos about them. Other companies in the lithography space include Japan's Nikon, Canon, and China's SMEE. Third and finally, we need to prepare the exposed wafer for the next step, which is etch. Here, we remove unwanted photoresist particles, clean off any remaining solvents, and hard bake the resist layer at the exact right temperature to harden it against etch errors. This hard bake also helps ameliorate something called the standing wave effect. Light during the lithography exposure phase goes through the resist, it hits the substrate, and bounces back up, and interferes with the light coming down, leaving these wave-like features. The hard bake helps smooth out the standing waves in the resist, perhaps by diffusing out the photoresist kind of like a melting, gooey, delicious chocolate chip. This hard bake is done on a 100 degrees Celsius hot plate for 1 to 3 minutes. We for real making pizzas here. The fab will also clean the wafers with ultra pure water before and after the whole step. In fact, just assume they are cleaning these wafers every time, all the time. After the lithography step is complete, we need to permanently transfer this pattern onto the underlying layers. This pattern transfer usually means to etch away the bits of the thin films left unprotected by the exposed photoresist. In other words, if lithography draws the outline, then etching cuts the paper. After etching, the photoresist is no longer needed, and we remove it in a stage called resist stripping. After this step, it is no longer easily possible to rework the chip. I like to think about etching as the conceptual opposite of deposition. The latter adds a layer, the former takes that layer away. There are two big industrial categories of etch tools, wet or dry. Under the hood, these use one or more of the same principles, chemical reactions, temperature reactions, or physical particle collisions. Wet etching is pretty conceptually simple. You spray a powerful acid etchant onto the wafer. The problem with this is uniformity. You can't tell the liquid to etch in just one direction. We call this an isotropic etch profile. This makes it harder to wet etch sharp corners or distinct features. Imagine a tub of chocolate ice cream like I am right now as I am writing this, and myself taking scoops out using a round ice cream scoop. Imagine how hard it is to get sharp right-hand edges with this scoop. That is the problem with isotropic etch profiles. Isotropic etches can etch underneath the resist lines, a situation known as undercutting. Some thinner lines might even be completely undercut. Undercutting isn't always bad. For instance, you need to do it for something like MEMS, which have free-standing structures. You undercut to release them. 
But here it creates a loss of resolution and sadness for the customer. The problem became quite significant in the 1980s when feature sizes shrank beyond the 3 micron limit. We want to etch in one direction, anisotropic etching. This desire for anisotropic gave us what is called dry etch, plasma etch or plasma assisted etching. There are many types of this etch, but one prominent example is reactive ion etch. We inject a mixture of gas chemicals into the top part of a vacuum chamber. One of those gases is a volatile etching gas, usually some angry acid based on chlorine and fluorine. Then we turn on a powerful radio frequency field around this mixture. The radio energy knocks out the electrons in the gases, leaving behind positively charged ions. This combo of negative electrons and positive ions eventually turns the whole thing into a plasma. Then we accelerate the positively charged ions in said plasma straight down towards the wafer like sand in a sandblaster. This is done using a powerful electric field that attracts them. The plasma chemically reacts with the wafer creating byproducts. For instance, chlorine reacts with silicon to create silicon tetrachloride. We can then quickly pump away this byproduct. So here we have the best of two worlds, the selectivity of a chemical reaction precisely oriented to get these vertical walls. We can also monitor the reaction's light remissions for metrology purposes. In a way, reactive ion etch and the PVD metal sputtering method we discussed earlier in this video are very similar. You have a plasma, accelerate ions towards a thing, and see them smash together. Current leaders in the dry etch world include Applied Materials, KLA, LAM Research, and Tokyo Electron. We have built the chip's structure. Now it is time to give it its electrical properties. As I mentioned, a transistor controls the flow of electrons from the source to the drain. That source and drain is created with impurity doping, the process of introducing exactly the right amounts of impurities into semiconductors. This can give silicon strange powers. For instance, doping silicon with erbium can make it emit light. But in this case, we are adding a few dopant atoms to the silicon in order to make it donate electrons, n-type dopants, and a few atoms to the other side of the silicon gate to make it accept electrons, p-type dopants. The element used for the former is usually arsenic, phosphorus, and antimony, and for the latter, boron. The concept of doping has been a part of the semiconductor industry since the very beginning. There are two primary methods to do it, diffusion and ion implantation. Up until the 1970s, the industry mostly used diffusion. With diffusion, we put the wafers into a high temperature furnace. Then we take the impurity, usually in liquid form, and heat it up with some oxygen. The impurity will react with the silicon and diffuse into it. However, diffusion had significant drawbacks. The ion distributions in the embedded material was uneven and haphazard. So, in the 1970s, the industry started switching to ion implanters. This is where the dopant atoms are injected directly into the silicon using an ion beam. We heat up the source gas and break it into a bunch of charged ions. We separate out some of those ions and accelerate them into an ion beam. The ion beam is then scanned over the wafer surface. These ions will collide with the silicon atoms and come to rest amongst them at a certain range under the surface. How deep depends on the ion's mass and speed. The upside is that we get better dopant distribution and more precise targeting. The downside is that the ions damage the structure of the silicon crystal. This requires a repair step known as annealing. Current players in the ion implanter market include applied materials, Varian, Axelis, and Nissan Ion Equipment. So now we have a better understanding of the various processes necessary for wafer fabrication. Now, let's talk fabs. The fabs clean room is split into processing areas or bays based on their work function. Wet bays, diffusion bays, photo bay, etch bay, implant bay, and so on. As you might expect, tools for etching are in the etch bay, photolithography in the photo bay, and so on. The whole room is raised up on the ground. This is partly to dampen vibrations and also so that we can install equipment subsystems, radio frequency for the plasma systems, vacuum pumps, liquid delivery for the various tools underneath the floors. 
The floors are equipped with grid panels so that air can circulate vertically up, down, and down, up through huge high efficiency filters. The area is split into multiple classes of cleanliness, class 10, 100, 1000, and so on. These classes are defined with a weird mix of metric and imperial units. Class 1 means for each cubic foot, there is less than one particle larger than half micron wide. Class 10, 10 particles, and so on. When the wafers are done, they are transferred to a lower class clean room for testing and packaging. Some fabs outsource this work to third parties, but a few do these in-house. Coverage of the semiconductor manufacturing process puts a lot of focus on lithography, ASML, the EUV lasers, and so on. And it is sort of justified. Lithography is in some ways different from the rest of the semiconductor manufacturing process. It contains a great deal of the value because we transmit chip IP through it. However, we should be clear that this is not the only little miracle happening inside the fab. Processes like deposition, etch, and ion implantation are critical to making the whole thing work. Studying them will help us all better understand the enormity and complexity of the semiconductor supply chain. It's far more than just TSMC and ASML. All right, everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, sign up for the newsletter, and I'll see you guys next time.